<clears throat> this is October 30th, 2009 at 10.30 in the morning. We are interviewing Harry Brown in his Schenectady, New York home. He served in the United States Army from June 1948 to December 1953. This interview is conducted by Ken and June Hunter. Will you please tell us your full name and when and where you were born? My name is Harold T. Brown, and uh, I was born in New York City, May 16, 1930. And what did you do before you entered the Army? Well, I was uh, in school, for one thing, and uh, working part-time jobs to support my a family at the time, my brothers and my sister. And then did you, uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? Oh, I enlisted. And why did you do that? Well, I guess at the time that I think back, we were a bunch of kids that uh, about 18 years of age, and while we were just not working, it's very difficult to get a job. So we just sat around and thought maybe we should look for something else to do. And I guess one of the guys came up with the idea, why don't we go down to Whitehall, New York, and join the Army? And there were 10 of us, actually. We got on an elevated train, took it down to Whitehall, and all enlisted. And we all chose the Orient, that is, uh, Japan. And did you think you'd be staying together if you... That was the idea. We thought we would be staying together and of course what happened was they broke us up into different groups. And I think, when I think back, there were four of us left in one group. And I thought, well, at least we're four together. We went to Japan as for, and two of the group decided they wanted to go elsewhere, so they did. The training was too hard. Now, speaking about uh, training, did you go through basic training, and where was it if you did go? Oh, we jumped out past that, yes. We went to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and uh, we had our training there, and I think it was uh, maybe about four or six weeks of intense training, I should say. And what were some of the kinds of things that you did in the basic training? Everything that we didn't want to do, like uh, the exercise that we had to go through, which was pretty strenuous for kids that never did anything before, and uh, getting used to saluting and having respect for the officers, and a lot of things fell into place, however, and we all seem to have gotten along pretty well. All right, from basic training, I imagine it was, what, six, eight weeks, or maybe a little longer? It, it's just possible it was more, because you know, I'm thinking back, and I really can't see it that, that clearly in my mind, but it was probably about six weeks or so. From basic training, what did you, where did, were you assigned? Well, right away they took us and assigned us to different outfits that uh, we would join up with. For instance, the four of us at that time were uh, set to go to uh, Japan in a place called Otsu which is uh, south of Kyoto. And the outfit that we were to uh, go to was the uh, 35th Regiment, 25th Division uh, Baker Company. And then what happened when you were assigned there? How did you get there? Did you well, go by ship, by plane? Well, in those days we went by these uh, Liberian tanker troop ships took us 
close to 30, 35 days just across the ocean. Very, very sickening experience if I can remember. But I, spare, I was spared because I worked down in the bowels of the ship in the bakery. So I never got to go up to, to the top. That's where everybody got sick. I didn't plan that. What was your occupational skill? Did they, uh, were you a basic infantryman, a rifleman? Well, I was uh, a rifleman at the time. However, when I got to Japan, I decided I'd like to go to school, and I did. So I took a correspondence course, and I also went to school by day to uh, more or less get away from the harsh training that went on. I took uh, clerical uh, training in the service. It went on for, I guess, three or four months, and uh, then I was assigned to a position in, in the company as a company clerk. I enjoyed it immensely. <laughs> What were some of your duties as a clerk? Well, I used to make out morning reports. I got to know all the men, which in those days was close to 200. Uh, that was what the company was, uh, 200 men. So I got to know all the faces, all the people, all the officers, all the sergeants, and all of their personal griefs and whatever as a company clerk because I handled all of their gripes every day. Now from uh, duties as a company clerk and then, and then, then going onto the ship uh, being as a cook, how did that come about to be a cook, a baker? Well I wasn't, I was just using that as an escape mechanism mm -hmm. to get away from being out on the uh, deck and I was just a hungry kid, you know, coming from the Lower East Side of New York, not having a good square meal for so long, I felt it was a good opportunity to feed my face. <laughs> so Ed, when you disembarked in Japan, where did you go and what was it like? Well, when we uh, landed at Japan, before we did, we were out at sea looking, and it was the most eerie feeling you could imagine. You know, you, I'm leaving New York, the Lower East Side. I hadn't even been upstate New York. Now you can imagine it was like going to Mars. Now I'm out there in the bay, in Yokohama Bay, looking toward the land, and all sorts of thoughts are going through my mind. After all, we just had been at war with Japan, and I wondered about the customs, the feelings, and how people would treat you, look at you. All of that went through our minds. It was fascinating to think that we were coming and, and going among a different culture of people who fought us very strenuously, I might add, during the Second World War. After all, this is now 1948. It's only three years from, from the time the war ended. Okay, so then after you got those visions in your, in your mind there and got to be stationed apparently at some facility in Japan? Yeah, we went to a place called Ocho. It's a little town. It was a regimental uh, Garrison, it's called the 35th Regiment, and uh, that was in itself another experience because it was all closed to the outside. It was it was uh, fenced in, and it was huge. It was a huge uh, facility with with all sorts of uh, uh, ha you know. Uh, buildings that housed the different battalions, uh, companies, and of course regiments. Well, the regiment of 35th Regiment. And uh, 
it was quite a nice thing. It had a lot to offer, little PXs and uh, NCO clubs and all sorts of nice facilities. How long were you in there uh, in, in Japan at this facility? And were you assigned to a particular company? Yeah, I was in a banker company, uh, the 35th Regiment, 25th Division. And uh, I was there for, I would say, oh, let me see, two, possibly two and a half years. Two and a half, possibly two and a half years or somewhere about that period of time. Did you have contact with the Japanese population yes. there? What, would, uh, what was the general reception that you got from the Japanese well, people? We didn't have the same language, but <clears throat> my experience with the people uh, of Japan was uh, they were very friendly, courteous, and uh, it got so that uh, when we would meet them, say for instance at the PX, they were just about all over on the base, they would actually invite us to their homes and for dinner and stuff like that. And, and it was uh, almost like being home. They were very courteous and very inquisitive. And uh, did they serve you any of their special foods? Yes, they did. Like what? Well, for one thing, we tried sukiyaki, which I loved, was great. And uh, they had uh, also sushi, they had a lot of fish, and believe it or not, steaks and tomatoes. <laughs> mm. Just like we, we eat home at home in uh, the United States. And was food very costly for them back then? I know today it is. I, I never took note of what anything cost because you know, most of the time we lived on base and everything was reasonably priced for us. Uh, Japanese seemed to be getting along though uh, pretty well economically, I would think. So then what was your next assignment? Well, that's, that's what I was uh, getting into. I decided that uh, the, the uh, constant boring routine of training day in and day out was something that I said, no, I've got to change that. So I decided to uh, apply for uh, a, a correspondence, uh, taking uh, courses and stuff. And then I also decided to take a clerical training in a facility which was in a place called Osaka, Japan. Uh, believe it or not, that that was like 15, 20 miles away. So every day I would be trucked there and back. And I, const I stood with the training for a period of three, maybe four months. And when my captain got wind of what I was doing, there was a shortage in the company. They needed a clerk. So he asked me if I wanted to, to do the clerk job, so I accepted it. So I was in that position for some time. What, do, what, what kind of duties is the clerk? Uh, was it uh, more intense? Uh... It's a very cushy job. Like I said, you get to know the people, you get to write out reports, um, make morning reports, reporting illness, sickness, discharges, promotions, court-martials, everything. In fact, I, I prepared court-martials. A little story about that is uh, I had a friend that <laughs> was being court-martialed and, uh, you know, I, I felt very sympathetic for him. I had to make out his court-martial. And you know, court martial papers, preparation is such that everything has to be precise. And it is examined and re-examined. 
Well, somehow, in this case, his name was Clarence Shook, there was an error in that transcript, and the time limit for applying the court-martial ran out, and so he wasn't tried after all. It was a minor infraction, really. <laughs> I decided to do that on purpose. It happened. It happened. So then, um, when you were you worked uh, in that particular job, then what did you do after that? Because we know you changed. <laughs> well, after I did that, uh, what happened was we went out on a amphibious maneuver out in the, on the ocean, and I was assigned uh, temporarily to a ship called the USS Mount McKinley, and uh, I was aboard that ship. And I wasn't with my outfit now because um, I was now assigned temporarily to the ship working in logistics uh, with the 35th uh, Infantry Command. And my job there was to uh, type out the sten and stencil uh, maneuver training programs and make sure that all of the uh, battalions and companies got a copy of it because it would reflect what would be done in the uh, maneuver. So I worked very closely with the general staff and and I enjoyed that very much. What happened was, after being out at sea with uh, uh, on the uh, ship, uh, we came in, <clears throat> I think it was, uh, oh, uh, first, maybe the first week of June of 1950, and we came to our uh, garrison I got off the ship and we uh, suddenly were given a notice that uh, all the all, uh, you know, passes would be uh, curtailed. Uh, something big was going on and, well, we were all wondering, guessing, talking about it and, and then it turned out that uh, there was an incursion in uh, South Korea, where the North Koreans crossed a parallel on, uh, I believe it was, June 25th in that area. And so what happened was they took our group, part of it, as they did other groups, in the battalion, the regiment, and so forth, and put together a group that would eventually be called Task Force Smith, which was the first incursion of American uh, soldiers sent to Korea in a place called Osan to stop the Red Invasion going south. Um, many of these men in that first encounter were parts of our group, and so you might say that it was our first action. Uh, the action uh, failed, the North Koreans overpowered Task Force Smith, and everyone went scurrying. Thereafter, there was an alert put out that more had to be done. So MacArthur issued the order that the 25th Division, which I was a part of, should be sent directly to Korea, along with the 24th Division, and of course the 1st Cav and the 2nd Division. We were the 2nd Division in, and we went into combat almost immediately. The uh, combat situation for us was intense, deadly, 
many, many casualties. And what would happen is we would be assigned a position to hold. We would hold it. We also told hold it until it became unbearable because we didn't have enough troops at the time. We were very much uh, under a sizable group to contend with what was happening. We would hit and run, hit and run. This was the attitude at that time. And we made hell, we, we made it hell for them, but <laughs> the, I think at the time, I recall the uh, forces were numerically superior to us in the area of 20 to one. These were seasoned soldiers we were fighting. They were what they call the Inman gun. They were specially trained soldiers by Russia, and they had been preparing the North Koreans for some time, obviously. These men ranged in age anywhere from 25 to 35, so they were very well mature. They were seasoned fighters because they had been in other battles prior to this one. So it was pretty much stacked up against us and we prayed for relief, which never seemed to come. In June of 1950, the situation became desperate. We were at Tegu. General Walker at the time felt he could not hold the position and he actually asked MacArthur to move further south to a place called uh, Pusan. Now Pusan was like the last city to the ocean. At this time, General Walker issued an order for all contingencies, hold your positions or die. And that was what happened. From that time, all through August, was the monsoon that came and stood with us and made life just miserable. We were living in this day by day. The greatest thing I ever had, as I recall, was the poncho. It became my, my house. And, boy, I'll never forget that poncho. And we uh, sort of buckled down and held our positions. We'd fight every night as they knew that was the time to strike. We were actually a very unique group of guys, when you think about it. Colonel Fisher had an attitude when he trained our outfits in Japan, and he was a war hog. That man trained us and trained us, and we, at times, cursed him. Little did we realize that what he put us through was almost similar to what Patton put his Third Army through in the Second World War. He made us rigid, strong, and unremitting. Though when we held a position, we held it, and we supported one another in, in combat. You couldn't really find a better fighting group than the 35th Regiment. Uh, what happened was, in the next incident, in the fight, finally, as August came and went, on the 31st of August, 1950, it was decided logistically by the commanders in the area 
that we were going to hit, be hit by one of the greatest uh, forces known up to that time. So we were, they were waiting for the monsoon to end, that is the enemy. And we, we sort of realized that the word went around. So we occupied a position, that is the 35th Regiment, along the Nactown River. And I was in Baker Company, and I was at the highest position. It was 1,100 feet high. And what we were told to do was to observe everything down in the valley and along the river. And what we did observe was activity going on in the evening time on the river itself. So we would make these reports available. They would send out scouts to investigate what was going on. And lo and behold, they were building bridges just under the surface of the water. And this went undetected for a while until it was discovered, and I think they had three bridges now going across the Nactar. Well, what happened was they got tanks across, they got two divisions across, they got artillery across at night, and then we were alerted when it was found out to hold our positions rigidly for the possible onslaught. And the onslaught occurred on the 31st of August at 11.30 p.m. And they came, and they came by the droves. And they came up the mountains and the hills. And their objective was Baker Company, because we held the high ground, and we also held the position where we saw everything. They wanted to get the brain out of this altogether. And we were hit day and night, and we'd run out of ammunition, and we'd get airdrops. And then when we couldn't get airdrops, we took the machine gun belts and took the shells out one by one so we could load our rifles. And we fought day and night. And in this here situation, we had bodies laying all over the place. I'm talking about American bodies. They were sitting in foxholes just all over, and there was no way the graves of registration could come in. So we had no idea what was outside of our lines at this time, because the fighting was relentless, it went on and on. There came a period when, for three days, we had no water. Oh, in my situation, I personally got involved in talking to the lieutenant at the time. He was lieutenant or captain, uh, I can't think of his name. So I said I would be glad to go through enemy lines to get the water. So I took a five gallon tank with a couple of other guys and we went through the lines and everywhere we went, we run across American outposts and then Korean. And we'd run like heck. And we finally made it to the water, got the water, came back up the mountain same thing happened going back to all of these here positions where the enemy was and but it was in the stealth of night we were able to pull it off. You never saw a happier group of people in all your life when those canteens came out automatically. Everybody in line accepting a little bit of the water and we had also took our helmets and filled them and <laughs> it was funny, but it was a great thing that happened. Anyway, we were 
on this position for six days. On September 6th, the enemy took off. They couldn't handle us. And as a result of that uh, engagement right there, we got the uh, Distinguished Unit Citation. We were the first ones in Korea that actually held a position against a superior force. And to each and every man in that outfit, there was happiness beyond your imagination. So that was also, it's been written in papers since then, if you ever want to search it out, it's called, the citation was given to the 35th Regiment as a result of actually the 1st Battalion, which was my group, and uh, the citation says, the Rock of the Nam, the Nam was the river. And we became the rock of the dam, and we were the first ones to win such a wonderful citation in the beginning of the war. Thereafter, on September 13, we had the Incheon invasion. But before the invasion, what happened was we fought very, very hard thereafter, even after the 6th. We advanced, we'd retreat. We'd advance, we would retreat. I must have had that for those six days that I spoke of earlier, we were surrounded for six days. There was no way out, and the colonel was asked, why didn't you retreat? He said, retreat where? There was no place to go to. So, you know, when you have a force and a group of men that work together, you have no idea, it's like a sport. If you work together, you can accomplish anything. And there was a lot of glory that came out of that. It was a wonderful experience for me. You know, I'm part English and Irish. My parents came from the other side. And I'm not truly, at that time, I didn't think like an American. But I was so proud to be an American. <laughs> we did some wonderful things. and courageous things. Anyway, the Incheon invasion took place on uh, September 13, and it was called Operation Chromite, and SCAP, which is the supreme um, commanders of the Allied powers, <clears throat> disagreed heartily against it. They thought uh, MacArthur was off his bonkers, you know. And, but I'll tell you, he fooled everybody. It, it went off well. And what, as a result of that, you see, what happened was, when that Inchon invasion took place, it relieved the South. Because all those troops that we were fighting <clears throat> now had to go to back up <clears throat> their contingencies fighting around Incheon and Seoul. So we were really left with less of the fight, which was quite a relief because up to this point, it was day in, day out, day in, day out. Casualties, my God, casualties were enormous. I mean, my outfit might have changed three or four times in the time that I was there. So when Incheon occurred, we advanced north. September went into October, and now the job was to take care of those pockets of resistance that were still there. So now our jobs changed in that we would go into the mountains now and fight these little pockets and bring them out. And this went on for much of a month battle. I think what happens now is that we had now come to realize that we had won the war, actually. 
because the resistance dwindled. And then the northern echelons were running across less and less resistance. The final plan was that MacArthur felt that if it goes to the northern frontiers at this time, he could solidify Korea as one. There would be no division thereafter, because the division, of course, occurred during the Second World War between Russia and the United States. And it was a good plan that he had. However, we didn't realize that there was something else going on. So from time to time, we've run across groups of Orientals that we would find out they were Chinese. So there was a certain infiltration coming about here. And when they actually questioned them harshly, I might say, it started naming divisions, regiments, armies. So the speculation was that China might be another problem. <laughs> but, you know, MacArthur said to us all, you'll all be home for Christmas. And that was a wonderful thing, because my home would now be Hawaii, because that's where the 25th Division came from. See, we lost our colors in the Second World War, but we regained them in Korea, so our new home was going to be Hawaii. Anyway, it was just a dream, darn it. <laughs> and we, uh, of course, advanced further north, and the casualties started to cease. And then my friend, Richard Whalen, came into this picture from what I learned later. He belonged to the 1st Cavalry Division. He was up around a place called Ulsan, North Korea, in the month of November, early November, I think, November 2nd. And he was hit by the Chinese and he was captured. And I didn't learn this, of course, until I came. I, I never knew anyone was ever in Unsan. So what happened was we went up to Unsan ourselves. And we were there for maybe three days of intense fighting. Suddenly we ran across some resistance. It's a new ball game now. Many of my men, our men, I was a platoon leader, ran into skirmish after skirmish, and there was this one particular hill that we kept trying to take, and we'd get bloodied pretty badly, but we just couldn't take it. There was a force in that hill that was something sizable. So the officers got together and decided to retreat southerly and take up a position of uh, defense because now we're running into something that's pretty mean. And we did. We must have run, God, about 10, 12 miles back, set up our positions. And then my outfit became a part of another group called Task Force Dalvin. Task Force, Task Force Dalvin was designed to go in and reconnoiter the mountains and hills all around, find out what was going on. So we went up into the mountains, we reconnoitered, we found evidence that there was a sizable army afoot. So we set up our defense in that region. We were a part of, uh, like I say, Task Force Dalvin, comprised of the US Rain, Rain, United States Rangers, one company, Baker Company, it's my outfit, another company, 
and another company called E Company, and we had artillery support and tanks. And we waited it out, and on the 26th of November, all our radio communications broke down. Uh, obviously, the Chinese had taken our radios and stuff and were communicating on them, so we heard their voices. We panicked. We knew we were up against a battle. So we hunkered down, and that night it was the most incredible sight you ever could remember or even think of. It was all around us, the sky lit up with tracer bullets. And the tracers went completely around, and they came closer and closer. Before you know it, the firing stopped. And then we heard hordes and hordes of voices coming up the mountain. And we couldn't see a thing. But whoever they were, they didn't seem to give a damn. They kept coming up and up. Finally, they went over the crest. And in no time, we were now involved in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And uh, it was futile. It wouldn't work. We couldn't continue to fight them off. So what happened was we decided to break up into groups and each of us took a different route out. We were all looking to get to the river. The river is called the Chung Chan River. It was also written about by S.L.A. Marshall and was called the, the River and the Gauntlet. Now, if you know what a gauntlet is, when you go through and they knock the heck out of you from all sides, this was our gauntlet. And the piece that S.L.A. Marshall wrote about was in particular very moving because it, it mentions my outfit. It goes on to say, I can look at it here. He speaks of the sacrifice of the orphan Company B, which we were, contingency which saved the main battle unit from inevitable defeat. We were sacrificed as a saving point for the rest of the task force. And we sustained very heavy casualties in that. We were 203 men. I think out of that, 26 were able to get out. And that's when I joined the infamous Manchurian Death March. Because as we broke up into groups, we ran into overwhelming odds. And we were taken and were put into this march. We marched day and night, God knows where, but we marched and it was cold, it was freezing. Temperatures in that time and period dropping down to 30, 40 below zero. We were walking straight into what they call the Siberian Straits uh, in North Korea. Uh, was bordering Vladivostok. That's where we were headed. The place called Pyokdam or Camp Pyokdam. And we walked and walked and it took us many days and we never got quite to Pyokdam. We ended up in a place called Death Valley. And here all the men from Baker Company and the Turkish Brigade and the English and the Irish, all that were vanquished on that battlefield that day, and those that were vanquished at a very famous 
place called Kunaria. If anyone wants to know about what it was like, they should look up the history about Kunaria. In a way, I was glad I was captured where I was because Kunaria was hell. It was where everybody had to go through that did escape. But it was on both sides of that road that they were sniped to death and did not even given the opportunity to surrender. And I've had some friends that were in that battle and it was a total loss. We lost more men in that period of time which I'm talking about now goes from September to November. More men in that period of time than was lost in the whole Korean War. So that is wounded, dead, prisoners of war. Becoming a prisoner of war didn't guarantee you life. Actually, it was worse than combat. It was worse than the day-to-day -day battles that took place. A bullet was fast, but starvation, humiliation, and all that was a horrible, horrible experience for all of us. Uh, with maybe you have experienced not having a meal one day and you notice a gentle gnawing in your stomach. Well, if you can only contemplate that feeling going on from day to day to day, it becomes very painful. It drives you crazy. It makes you think. Men are not men like they should be because it seems Darwin's theory of uh, survival sort of comes into play here. People become selfish. There's no more the camaraderie that you used to have. As long as you have a full stomach, that's all great. But it all comes down to survival of the fittest and survival everybody wants and it becomes treacherous. So from there, we went in this march, day by day. One thing I had to add was, in that last battle, I did something very smart, almost as though I had a foreboding of what was to come. I picked up a sleeping bag and wrapped it around my waist, only to realize that while everybody was walking, there'd be a time when you'd sit down to rest. The chill of the, the weather was enormous. It was cold. People came down with frostbite in their legs, in their feet, in their hands, in their, on their ears. We weren't well-dressed at all. And what happened was I felt, you know, this is like no way out. I've never been in a situation personally like this. I didn't know anybody in this march. All my men were gone. I said, where are they? All I saw was a bunch of guys that couldn't hardly speak English. There was Turks and, well, there was English and Irish. But uh, what happened to my outfit, I wondered. So it turns out that I said, I can't stay with this march. So what I did was, as we were walking along, that the Chinese following us, I looked for the opportunity to break from the march. I didn't know where I was going to go, but it certainly had to be better than this. So I broke from the march and ran down a steep hill. No one caught sight of me. And I was like a beggar looking for food came upon a farm, but there was nobody there. But I was cold, I was exhausted, and I saw this big hay stack. And what I did was I jumped into that darn thing and I burrowed into it. And I took my sleeping bag and I crawled into it. And hours passed and I felt a very good sense of freedom, you know? I didn't realize what was happening, actually. 
the frozen, the cold was so penetrating, no matter where I was on the outside, biting me, was coming into me. I was actually experiencing delirium, and it's what they call a hyper what is it? Hyperventilation? The hyper, no, it's not hyperventilation. It was when you get the chills and you start to shake, it's a sign of uh, that your system is ready to break down. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a word right now. It's funny. And at that particular time, a Chinese girl came by. He noticed me shaking. I guess he noticed the hay. He pulled me up and he cursed at me, whatever he said, I don't know, but he thrust his rifle into my side, forward, I walked forward, and I don't know how long I was there, really. I might have been there a day, or a day and a half for that matter, I might have been unconscious, I don't know. But it was nighttime now, it wasn't the same night, I know that. And he took me and he forced me along and we walked for a good part of uh, half a day or so, came up upon the uh, defeated army, the 8th Army, and I was put back into the line of march. We continued to march, and then they put us in a cave one time. It was the coldest place you ever imagined. And Anyway, to make it a long, a long story shorter, we got to our prison camp and uh, we endured a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, and the men died day by day until the squads became thinner and Thinner, and there again, I endured this and said, "This is no place for anyone." Everywhere I looked, someone was dying, and then, of course, I got very sick myself. And what happened was, I ended up in a prison hospital. But before I did do that. I made another attempt at escape, and I escaped with another guy. And we boarded a ship out in the harbor. We overtook the captain. I was about to take the ship out, heading south on the Yellow River. And all of a sudden, the ship was inundated by a whole Chinese garrison, and they took us put me in prison again, in another prison outside, it was a civilian prison. And while in the prison, I had my hands tied behind my back, my, my legs were tied, and my neck was tied to my arms so that when I struggled, I would choke. And <laughs> I saw a bottle on, on the floor there, and somehow or other kicked it, broke the glass, cut my bonds, and both of us escaped again. Only we were captured again. So I spent quite a bit of time in jail, in jail. Anyway, some time later they released me, put me back in the outfit, and then they put me in a hole in the ground for some two or three weeks to teach me a lesson and so that everybody else could see what had happened. From that point, I went to this hospital, and like I said, I was dying, and the last thing I think is that they operated on me and opened my side, used cold water to numb me, and they took a hog's liver and shoved it in, in my side, sewed me up. Now, I said, what the heck is that all about? Well, they called it liver therapy, 
It's not that they implanted the liver, it's like they put a liver so it would dissolve and go into my bloodstream. The you know, only funny thing is, it worked. I was dying, and all of a sudden I came back. And then you've heard of acupuncture? Well, they tried acupuncture on me and all that, and it helped. Well, when the war ended, I came home and I told all the medical doctors here in the United States about what I went through. And I told them about the liver implant and the acupuncture. They didn't believe me. But they got to believe it one day when President Nixon opened up relationships with Red China and Mao Zedong. And they learned about acupuncture and liver transplant. And that's how the world got to know about it. <laughs> but I have still bear the scar on my side here, and, and I laugh at them. You know, everybody in that, that outfit in that hospital did die, except for there were 20 of us that took that, that I took anything so I could live. If it was escaping, that would be one thing. If they had something to offer medically, I would accept it anything that would work. Anyway, in coming home years later, I read an article about a soldier that was found and he was turned over and the DNA proved it to be one of my good friends. Prakus was his name and uh, it opened up a whole new book with me because it turns out that that fellow was part of the group that we lost. Another investigation determined that many of the casualties that lay in that farmer's field were from my outfit. And uh, this I uh, talked about not long ago at a ceremony in Rhinebeck, New York, at a memorial setting I said, all this happened many years ago, ancient history, right? It would be if it had had closure. There was still that question, what happened to the late great B Company? The answer to that question came to me about 50 years ago. That happened 50 years ago, about two months ago. A semi-annual 25th Division magazine was delivered to my home. My eyes caught the following article. Cacti soldier laid to rest. As I read the unfolding story, tears streamed uncontrollably down my cheek. The story tells of a battle at Unsan, North Korea, and a terrible loss of life on November 26, 1950. In 1999, over 200 bodies were discovered in farmers' fields where they were unceremoniously buried. One of the men, couple Raymond Mendoza Fracas, whom I knew very well many years ago, was one of the identified deceased along with other members of Company B. So in ending in this Memorial Day that I delivered this, let us give reverence and prayer to all of those that paid the ultimate price and for the sake of peace and liberty in our generation, let us not use the word forgotten again, because the Korean War was the forgotten war. Okay, well, <clears throat> thank you very much for serving our country and for sharing your experience with us. Thank you for taking this interview.